Hey everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's presentation, we will once again be talking about American AR pattern carbines in Israeli military service. But rather than the M16 based carbines we discussed in the last video, we are now turning our attention towards more modern M4 derivatives. And I'll tell you guys right from the start, I am excited for this video. Due to the unexpected popularity of IDF Carbine Part 1, linked in description in case you missed it, I was fortunate enough to get in contact with a number of current and former IDF service members, some of whom were very generous with their time and directly assisted me during the research phase of this video. So before anything else, I wanna offer my sincere gratitude to everyone who contributed, Daniel in particular. I've tried to integrate as many of your insights as possible. With that in mind, let's briefly map out the subject and goals of today's presentation. As usual, this will be a technical firearm analysis which prioritizes information quality over entertainment. I'll do my best to keep it fun and engaging, but more so than anything else, I strive to be comprehensive, detailed, and accurate. The subject to this discussion will be flat top M4 type carbines in Israeli service, and more specifically, distinctly Israeli M4 configurations, which are made using a combination of American and Israeli parts. It should be noted that Israeli companies like IWI, MTAN, and Gilboa do manufacture fully domestic M4 type firearms for the IDF, and while very interesting in their own right, those weapons are outside the scope of this video. Within those left and right limits, we will be discussing how the IDF M4s are configured and therefore identified, what roles they fill in the IDF, and how they are perceived by Israeli soldiers. Additionally, I will be conducting a live fire test of multiple configurations of cloned IDF M4s and drawing on my background as a U.S. Army small arms repairman and civilian firearms enthusiast, to offer an American perspective on these weapons. As one final note before we begin, please be aware this channel has no sponsors, no patrons, and nothing to sell you, which means I absolutely depend on viewer engagement. If I earn it today, please don't forget to hit any combination of like, comment, and subscribe. That is what fuels this channel and makes it possible for me to make more and better videos. Without further ado, let's get right into it. The first thing to understand about the Israeli M4 is that the term M4 does not mean precisely the same thing in the IDF that it means in the United States military. When you say M4 to an American service member or knowledgeable enthusiast, they will typically think of a specific model designation which exists in a limited number of well-defined configurations. That doesn't mean that all M4s are identical, they most certainly are not, but it does mean that the vast majority of M4s are easily recognizable. And once you know which generational revision, modification package, and contract manufacturer you are dealing with, you can generally predict every aspect of how it will be put together. Additionally, underneath those aforementioned variations, there is an incredibly consistent feature set which most of us just take for granted. For example, US M4 upper receivers are always M4 upper receivers, meaning that they have brass deflectors, round forward assist buttons, and M4 feed ramps. Additionally, M4 lower receivers are almost always M4 lower receivers, which among other things means that they are made by Colt or FN and roll marked with an M4 model designation. I could go on and on, but the point is that in an Israeli context, the term M4 has a looser definition. Although the IDF has plenty of factory produced American M4s which meet the strictest M4 definition, they also extend that M4 label to a huge number of domestically assembled carbines which fill an M4 role yet do not always contain traditional M4 components. For example, many if not most Israeli M4s use M16A1 lowers. Technically, this has been done in the U.S. military as well, but that was incredibly rare by comparison and typically only done by specialized units for specialized reasons. In Israel, however, it is extremely common and seemingly done for no reason other than they have tons of M16A1 lowers and they might as well use them. And that's just one example. We'll save a detailed breakdown of possible variations for later in the video. For now, the takeaway is that M4-based IDF carbines exhibit much greater component diversity than their American equivalents. And if you're starting to get a bit of deja vu from the first video, well, you've got the right idea. Remember that in a very real sense, the Israeli Defense Forces Small Arms Inventory contains a veritable museum of AR-15 development. Over the last half century or so, Israel has amassed everything from Eugene Stoner's earliest trial rifles to the latest and greatest iterations of the AR platform. And as I said multiple times in the first video, the IDF places a much greater value on effectiveness than it does on homogeneity. Unlike the United States, which throws away staggering quantities of perfectly good weapons on a surprisingly frequent basis, Israel understands that 500,000 
M4s is a lot more useful than 50,000 M4s. In summary, an IDF M4 is basically just any combination of AR-15 parts, which includes a carbine length barrel and a flat top upper receiver. In some cases, these weapons are indistinguishable from American M4s, and in other cases, they are very much a unique combination of parts that would not likely be observed anywhere outside of Israel. What is perhaps most important, however, is that regardless of which type of M4 an IDF soldier is issued, they all have the same manual of arms and are therefore essentially interchangeable. In other words, while not all Israeli M4s use strictly M4 parts, the parts they do use are always put together in such a way that effectively mimics M4 performance. Speaking of the M4 role, let's go ahead and break that down before we get into the nitty gritty of components. Based on my research and interviews, the M4-based IDF carbine occupies several overlapping roles within the small arms inventory of the IDF, although that may be subject to change in the near future. Within the IDF's conventional forces, the M4 has historically held a bit of a confused status. It's a weapon which has been given obvious priority over the M16-based carbines we discussed in part one, yet it was often sidelined by the indigenous Tavor series. For much of the 21st century, full-time soldiers in many of the IDF's most prestigious infantry brigades have been issued TR-21s or X-95 micros, whereas M4s were limited to support personnel or select reservists. That said, the precise opposite arrangement was utilized by some other esteemed brigades, including armor, artillery, and airborne infantry units. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but for now the takeaway is that perception of the M4's role really varies within the IDF and seems to largely depend on where someone served. By contrast, the M4 holds a much more clear status among Israel's special operations forces and is in fact the weapon of choice for many of the IDF's best operators. Just as an illustration of this point, the ongoing war in Gaza has resulted in very public coverage of high profile special operations, with hostage rescue being among the most critical of these taskings. When we look at footage and still images from missions like the June 8th hostage rescue, we see that the operators on the ground largely chose to use M4s. So what's going on here? Well, as best as I can tell, there is a real level of debate and uncertainty regarding the long-term status of the M4 in Israeli service. Since September of 2021, there have been conflicting reports coming out of the IDF on this issue. On the one hand, there are verifiable reports that the IDF is pushing for a widespread standardization on the M4 platform and moving towards large-scale domestic manufacture of fully indigenous ARs. On the other hand, there are equally verifiable reports that the IDF is still actively placing orders for X-95 micros and high-profile conventional brigades such as Gavati, Nahal, and Golani show no signs of setting down their Tavors just yet. Enough of the big picture though, let's move into what actual IDF soldiers think of the M4. Long story short, the opinions I received were mixed, and hopefully now we have a little context into why that might be. The soldiers I was most interested to hear from were those that had used both Tavors and M4s during their course of service, and that would typically happen when someone transferred from active duty combat arms into the reserves. I did speak to several people who had precisely that experience, However, the takeaways they shared were not consistent. Some guys had a strong preference for the Tavor, others preferred the M4, and a few didn't seem to care either way. So what can we make of this? Well, the truth is I can't tell you anything for certain because the problem for me is that I have absolutely no experience with any variant of Tavor. I've heard many things from people that I trust, and I will admit I carry a baseline skepticism for bullpup designs in general. However, I still try to avoid commenting on things I don't have firsthand experience with. So as to how those two weapons actually compare, I'm not the one to say. What I will do is offer a few personal observations regarding what I heard. Quick disclaimer, these are only my opinions and educated guesses, so take them with a grain of salt. First, like the US, Israel is a country with a strong national identity and a proud history of domestic weapon production. In reading messages from IDF soldiers, I was left with the impression that at least for some, there was an undercurrent of bias in the comparison based on national pride. Tavors are marked in Hebrew, M4s are marked property of the US government, and for soldiers putting their lives on the line for the Israeli state, that could be a factor. How much of a factor that really is, I have no idea, and of course it should be acknowledged that I as an American might well exhibit an opposite bias, but either way, it does make me curious just how Israeli perception of M4s might evolve in the event that 100% Israeli-made examples were broadly issued. Perhaps something to pay attention to in the future. 
A second interesting factor I think I might have picked up from the comments is the idea that for some IDF soldiers, Tavor rifles and the X95 Micro in particular carry an elevated status due to their association with elite conventional infantry units and therefore a vaunted arm of Israeli ground power. Depending on where an IDF soldier served, he or she may express an opinion based more on the role they have seen a rifle fill rather than the strictly mechanical properties of the weapon. Once again, I'm totally speculating, but these types of conflations absolutely occur in the US military, so I think it's a possibility worth considering here. Third and finally, I had a few IDF soldiers make comments to me about the M4's poor reliability under field conditions, and considering that a huge portion of my job in the US military was M4 maintenance, I have strong opinions on that. For the purpose of this video, I can barely scratch the surface of what I want to say on the subject, but the most important takeaway is that reports of poor M4 reliability tell me a lot more about the unique challenges faced by IDF armors than they tell me about the weapons themselves. Keep in mind that despite the enormous amount of real-world experience the IDF has on the AR platform, it's still a small splash in the bucket compared to the data that the U.S. Ordnance Corps has gathered on its standard service weapon of over 50 years. For Americans like myself, the strengths and weaknesses of that particular weapon are a well-defined quantity. A properly maintained M4 is one of the most dependable small arms ever devised. However, that performance does come with a preventative maintenance burden that is higher than some of its competitors. That burden isn't what I would call unreasonable, but it's certainly much higher than something like a Kalashnikov pattern, which can often go tens of thousands of rounds without seeing a drop of oil or a single spring replacement. And before anyone accuses me of swooning too hard over the Kalashnikov, I'll also point out that most AKs have holes in the receiver large enough for a small marsupial to crawl into, Meanwhile, ARs are exceptionally well sealed from the elements. And the point of all that is simply to highlight that combat reliability isn't some simple metric defined by a single factor, but rather a complex set of characteristics which often involve some degree of trade-off. Whether or not these specific trade-offs offered by the M4 are worthwhile depend almost entirely on the end user's ability to perform preventative maintenance checks and services at appropriate intervals. This, by the way, is the exact reason that the Taliban still typically gets from point A to point B in Toyota Hiluxes rather than exploit their fleet of suspiciously inherited UH-60 Blackhawks. Sometimes the cost of enhanced military capability is an increased preventative maintenance burden, and if that cost isn't paid, performance can fall off precipitously. In any case, when some IDF soldiers told me that their M4s made a habit of choking under field conditions, what I heard is that there was a failure in the logistic support structure for those weapons. And from what I think I understand about the IDF, that does make sense. IDF armors have a more challenging job than US armors. Not only are they required to service a wider array of weapon systems manufactured all over the globe, but even within the M4 platform, they also have to account for significant generational differences between components. So once again, I'm suspicious that if the IDF was to eventually adopt a truly standardized, domestically produced M4 derivative, maintainer's jobs could be streamlined and many of these reported issues would disappear. And like I said, all of that was educated speculation and food for thought. Do with it what you will, and let's move on to the next subject. All right, guys, we're now moving into what I think is the fun part of the video, identification and breakdown of components and configurations. As I mentioned earlier, an IDF M4 is basically any combination of AR-15 parts, which includes a carbon length barrel and a flat top upper receiver. This means that just like the M16-based IDF carbines we talked about in the last video, there are technically infinite variations of M4-based IDF carbines. That said, there are still some clear patterns and popular configurations which emerge from that chaos, and by defining those, we can get a lot better at identifying these things as a distinct variant. So here's the big picture recipe for a classic IDF M4. Take an M4, sprinkle in a few M16A1 components, and throw on some Israeli-made furniture and enablers. How many and exactly which components are added totally depends, but let's break down some options. In terms of the M16A1 elements that appear on IDF M4s, there are four big ones that jump out to me. We've got lower receivers, muzzle devices, forward assists, and barrels, so let's hit those one by one. We're going to reference this photograph as we go, as I think it really captures the essence of the variant. We're looking at two Israeli service members here, I'm guessing a team leader communicating with a designated marksman. In other words, two women following the same SOPs, using the same weapon in different roles. 
At first glance, both weapons appear to be fairly typical M4s, but let's look a little closer. We'll begin by directing our attention to the lower receiver of the soldier on the right, where we see a protruding detent channel aligned with the rear takedown pin. That tells us we are looking at an early generation M16 lower receiver, and like I said earlier in the video, M16 lowers on M4s are extremely common in Israeli service. Next up, let's take a look at the forward assist and muzzle devices for both women. The soldier on the right has the round style forward assist and 180 degree A2 flash hider, exactly what we would expect to see on an American M4. By contrast, the soldier on the left has a teardrop style forward assist and a 360 degree A1 flash hider which once again are M16 A1 components. And just in case there are any Israeli viewers who are wondering why any of this is noteworthy, the teardrop forward assist and A1 flash hider were removed from the American M16 in 1982, meaning that they never officially overlapped with the M4 in US service. Of course, both components work just fine on M4s. It's just very unusual for Americans my age to see that combination of features. And in fact, it is a reliable indicator that a given rifle has seen Israeli service. Finally, let's move on to barrels. If we glanced over this picture, it'd be easy to miss, but these two soldiers have completely different barrels. If we look at the M4 on the right, we can visually reference known ratios and the distinct steps machined into the barrel profile to determine we're looking at a standard 14 and a half inch M4 barrel, exactly what we'd expect to see on a US M4. If we look at the weapon on the left, however, we can use the same visual indicators to determine we are looking at a pencil profile barrel, approximately 12.6 inches in length. And if you watched my last video, you already know what's going on here. It pretty much has to be an M16A1 barrel, which was converted for carbine use according to the procedure I detailed previously. And this is just one example, but the takeaway is that we will see a wide range of barrel profiles and barrel lengths on IDF M4s that we would not typically see on an American M4. Specifically, we see pencil profile barrels and we see unusual lengths between 10.3 and 14 and a half inches, which is popular in the American commercial market but not frequently exploited by the US military. As one additional note, this almost certainly means that the Israelis have had to perform modifications to feed ramps as M16A1 barrels will not generally work reliably on M4 upper receivers without reprofiling the steel feed ramps present in the barrel extension. This is just another example of how the jobs of Israeli armors are more complicated than those of their American counterparts. With all that said, the very last thing I want to point out in this photograph is that in addition to highlighting the heterogeneity of IDF M4s, it also illustrates the underlying order and logic behind their construction. Despite these weapons using different generations of imported parts, they are also standardized where they can be, and the functional differences between the weapons complement the roles of the women carrying them. For example, you will note that the soldier in the marksman role has the longer, stiffer barrel, in a length which will correspond to the BDC reticle in her optic. Additionally, she has the muzzle device most suited for firing from a prone position, which is important considering that her weapon has a bipod. Nothing about this is haphazard. The IDF may use an eclectic range of parts, and sometimes this may lead to unique challenges, but let's also be crystal clear that they understand how these parts work and they utilize them in ways that make sense. Speaking of accessories like optics and bipods, let's move on to talk about furniture and enablers. If there is a single best way to identify an Israeli M4, it is probably by identifying the distinctly Israeli furniture and enablers which are often installed. After all, only some IDF M4s exhibit M16 components, but almost all exhibit some level of Israeli add-ons. So let's break those down. In terms of buttstocks, obviously we see plenty of USGI CAR-15 and M4 stocks, but we also see a ton of indigenous Israeli designs with the FAB GLR-16 and IMI TS-1 being particularly popular choices. American commercial designs also appear at a lower frequency, such as this excellent Magpul CTR we're looking at now. As far as pistol grips are concerned, once again, we see a lot of USGI A1 and A2 pistol grips, particularly A1s, but the FAB AG43 grip also shows up a lot. Moving on to rail systems, this is a bit more complicated, so I'll break it up into four categories. We've got rail accessories for standard polymer clamshell handguards, we've got drop-in polymer rail systems, we've got drop-in aluminum rail systems, and we've got free-floated extended handguards. Most IDF soldiers seem to be issued standard clamshell handguards, However, they typically have the option of enhancing those handguards with privately purchased accessories. The most cost-effective way to accessorize such handguards is to use Picatinny rail portions designed to attach directly to the existing vent holes. This is not a particularly strong mounting solution. However, for something like a weapon light, I think it's a good option. 
Also included in this category should be Picatinny rail portions which clamp directly to the front sight block. Technically, this isn't a handguard accessory, but it provides the same functionality and probably does so in a more sturdy fashion. Once again, these are very popular in Israeli service. Another option is aftermarket drop-in polymer handguards, and these are also quite common on issued IDF M4 setups. Here are a couple offerings from Fab Defense. This product basically clones the form factor of standard clamshells with the addition of molded Picatinny rail portions. And this one is essentially just a Magpul MOE M-Lock handguard. Here is exactly that product being used in 2024 by a friend of this channel. Either way, these are still low cost solutions. However, the mounting interfaces they offer are gonna be significantly more robust than clamshell vent holes, which were never intended to mount accessories. Also, something I like about both of the products we just showcased is that neither includes a 12 o'clock top rail, and I hope this discourages people from mounting optics and lasers. I do see that sometimes on IDF setups, and while I try not to be a backseat driver in matters of life and death, that is fundamentally a weak solution that should be avoided whenever possible. Next up, of course, we see plenty of drop-in aluminum quad rails. In addition to USGI rail adapter systems made by Knight's Armament or PNS, we see three primary Israeli-made models. These are the FAB NFR, the Command Arms XM4SD, and IMI's creatively named Aluminum Quad Rail Carbon Drop-In. And if anyone at home is curious how to identify these different products in pictures or video, the trick is always vent holes. The American RAS has seven large circular vent holes, the FAB NFR has 14 small circular vent holes or 11 diagonal slashes. The Command XM4SD has five oblong vents and the IMI product has two rows of seven oblong vents. Regardless of which product is being used, however, aluminum handguards like these allow you to start having a real conversation about mounting devices which need to hold zero. And as one last aside, we do occasionally see rail extensions being used in the IDF. I don't have any personal experience with these, but I have seen products that look just like this being used by the United States Marine Corps. Finally, it should be noted that just like everyone else, the IDF is moving towards deleting FSBs entirely, switching to low pros, and using full-length free float handguards with proprietary barrel nuts. Like in the US military, however, the use of such setups seems to be currently limited to more specialized roles, and I'm not gonna break those down in this video. Who knows, if this video does well, there might just be an IDF carbine part three. With rail systems out of the way, let's bang out a few more quick ones. I see tons of backup iron sight designs out there with products from MTAN, FAB, and IMI of Israel and Samson of the US turning up frequently. Regarding weapon lights, once again, we see a wide range. A particularly noteworthy brand I kept seeing is Nightcore. I've not personally seen this company's products in the US. However, after a little research, they seem to be comparable to Streamlight in quality. These are often configured with a tape switch and a distinctly coiled cable. Vertical foregrips are extremely popular on IDF M4s, and there are a huge array of distinctly Israeli designs out there, most of which are made by Fab Defense. These include fairly typical models, unusually angled models, and models with integrated bipods. Additionally, as I mentioned in the last video, Magwell grips show up quite frequently as well, and once again, that's a feature we really don't see so often in the US. Next, we have these tourniquet-style handguard wraps. They're not actually tourniquets, they're just wraps. I'm just referring to the mechanism by which they lock down. And these appear to be a more robust and versatile iteration of the green and black elastic straps we discussed in the last video. In addition to removing vibration from clamshell-style handguards, these can be used for cable management and also serve as a forward sling attachment point. Remember that the Israelis are very disciplined with removing extraneous noise sources from their weapons, so we're still seeing a lot of improvised fabric and paracord-based sling attachment points rather than the rattly factory sling swivels. But last but not least, let's talk about electro-optical aiming devices, and this is a subject we'll spend just a bit more time on. There are a handful of optics commonly seen on Israeli M4s, but by far the most popular is the Meprolite M5. And for all practical purposes, we can consider this a combination of the US M68 close combat optic and the SU-231 holographic. Like the CCO, it is a robust non-magnified reflex sight. However, it offers a wide open targeting window more akin to the EOTech. Also, unlike the Meprolite M21 we discussed in the previous video, it uses battery power and offers 16 user adjustable brightness settings. Issued M5s are sometimes seen complemented by one of several models of Meprolite magnifier, which I'm led to believe are usually privately purchased rather than issued. Jumping back to that Meprolite M21 for a moment, we do still see plenty of these in use on IDF M4s. However, they are not nearly as common here as they were on the M16-based carbons. 
There's probably a few reasons for this, but one of the most obvious is that the IDF clearly has a large number of proprietary gooseneck mounts, which only allow M21s to be mounted to carry handle uppers. In addition to those Meprolite models, we also see several popular American optics, the most common being four power ACOG RCOs and what appear to be EOTech XPS 3s. ACOG optics are exclusively issued to marksmen, and from what I can tell, EOTechs are most popular with higher ranking soldiers, like this gentleman whose face screams Brigade Commander. I can't read Hebrew captions though, so feel free to correct me in the comments below. Lastly, we do see a smattering of less common American optics, such as this Sig Romeo 8, which strikes me as an excellent, if not a little unusual choice. Now I realize I just said lastly, but the truth is we aren't done with optics yet because we still need to talk about IR devices, and that leads us to a very interesting revelation. In addition to using conventional IR devices, such as the American PEC-15 and the Israeli Sting, the Israelis are rather unique in their use of hybrid reflex sights which incorporate IR and visible designators slaved to the reticle. The specific models in widespread use are the Meprolite Moor and the ITL Mars. Frankly, I am fascinated by this concept and I see it as a way to potentially save a huge amount of weight on a night vision capable fighting carbon. Although these optics are fairly chunky compared to standard reflex or hollow sights, they are very light when you consider that they eliminate the need for an additional laser aiming module attached to the front of the weapon. Additionally, this also gives us the option of completely forsaking heavy aluminum handguards, which are generally only heavy for the purpose of providing a stable mounting platform for IR devices. Considering that these hybrid sights mount directly to the upper receiver, there is really no reason not to run ultralight polymer handguards, which will keep the weapon light and well-balanced. Those are rare and luxurious adjectives to associate with NV capable weapons, making this a very compelling alternative, at least on paper. And that's pretty much it guys. Obviously there are more components you might see on IDF carbines, but if you just know the ones we went over today, you will be in pretty good shape to identify a wide majority of examples in circulation. And that of course leads us into the hands-on portion of this presentation. So let's briefly go over the builds I tested and which components went into them. Unlike in the first video, I try to take a somewhat more holistic approach to setting up my own IDF M4. To that end, rather than just create one setup, I tried to test a few configurations to loosely simulate what a soldier might be issued by the IDF and how that soldier might upgrade their setup using parts commercially available in Israel. So let's break that down. In terms of the lower receiver assembly, I used a pretty basic M4 lower setup with carbine buffer assembly, A1 pistol grip, and CAR-15 stock. Over time, I swapped in an Israeli-made GLR-16 buttstock, an AG-43 pistol grip, and a Magwell grip. As for the upper assembly, the basic platform was of course a flat top M4 upper, and I used two barrels, one 14 and a half inch M4 profile barrel with A2 muzzle device, and the same 14.7 inch pencil profile barrel and A1 muzzle device I used in the previous video. It would have been a bit more accurate if I was able to cut down that pencil profile barrel to be a little shorter, but due to US federal law, that just wasn't possible for this project. Both of these uppers achieve a total length of 16 inches with their pin and weld muzzle devices, and I didn't want to register a short barreled rifle for the purpose of a single video. And once again, if any Israeli viewers are wondering what the heck I'm talking about, it really doesn't matter. US gun laws are permissive in some ways and very much not permissive in others. It's hard to predict. More importantly for the point of this presentation, the weight reduction present in a 14.7 inch pencil profile barrel is still very noticeable. I think it's still a great stand in for the chopped down M16 barrels commonly seen on IDF M4s. Either way, I tried to make up some clone correct points by throwing a teardrop forward assist on one of the tested uppers. In terms of furniture enablers, that's where I tried to get a little bit deeper. My most basic sight setup was a Samson IDF rear sight and a Meprolite RDS Pro V2 optic. That, by the way, is the commercial market designation for the M5, just as Comp M4 or Comp M2 are commercial market designations for the M68 CCO. The product is the same, however, the procurement channels and warranty processes are different. As for the front end, I started with standard M4 clamshell handguards with a Picatinny rail portion and weapon light attached to the six o'clock position. I was unable to source an authentic Israeli handguard wrap. However, I did hand sew a rough facsimile, which functions as a sling attachment point and cable management device. It also retains and presents this heavily modified streamlight tape switch. 
As testing went on, I replaced the rear sight with a Meprolite MMX3 magnifier, and I replaced the handguard with a Fab NFR aluminum handguard. Also threw on a Knight's Armament vertical foregrip. Obviously, I could have bought an Israeli foregrip, but frankly, I think foregrips are pretty boring, and I figured my budget would be better allocated to other components. So those are the builds. Let's talk about how they performed. Bottom line up front, these are M4s. They aren't particularly exciting, but they do exactly what an M4 is supposed to do. With that in mind, I will say I had a much different experience shooting these than I had shooting the M16 based IDF carbine I tested in the first video. And upon reflection, I think that all comes down to expectation bias. I went to the first video expecting technology from the 1980s and 1990s, and consequently, I ended up very impressed when the weapon performed like a 21st century fighting carbine. My expectations were lowered and therefore easily exceeded. I came into this video expecting 21st century performance, and while that's exactly what I got, I was comparatively less impressed. I came in with a high bar, and that bar was cleared, but only barely. So what's the takeaway? Well, it depends who you are. If you're a procurement officer outfitting a military unit, there's no question that the M4-based IDF carbine is a more broadly capable weapon system than its M16-based uncle. If you happen to be an individual soldier or an armed citizen, honestly, I can imagine circumstances under which I might make a case for either weapon, but the M4 still wins out more times than it doesn't. Again, it's more broadly capable. If, however, you're a collector, not unlike myself, I tend to think that the M16-based IDF carbine is overall a more interesting specimen. It might not be the latest and greatest, it certainly isn't, but it's shockingly capable for its age and probably one of the most iconic CAR-15 variants on the planet. By contrast, the M4-based IDF carbine is pretty much just an M4. It's a great weapon, but kind of boring. And if that sounds critical, it really isn't. It's not the IDF's job to make iconic weapons for collectors to ramble about. They really just need to break stuff and hurt people as efficiently as possible. This will work great for that. So that's really all I have to say on the big picture. If you know what an M4A1 feels like and is capable of, this pretty much does that. The different accessories and components do give it a noticeably different feel, and I absolutely felt a lot less comfortable practicing with this than I did with my American M4A1 or Satmod Block 2, but that's just a familiarity thing. So let's move on to briefly discussing the distinctly Israeli components I tested for this video, and then wrap up with a few final words about how they all work together. And like I said, I'll keep this pretty brief. I'm not gonna lie, I am very tepid on Fab Defense polymer furniture. I don't have any serious complaints, but I don't have any real praise either. If it's what you got, it seems like it'll work fine. Personally, I'm gonna stick with Magpul, BCM, and B5. That said, if you have any questions about any of the products I tested in this video, or you wanna see a dedicated review of them, let me know in the comments, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it at that. As for the aluminum furniture from Fab Defense, specifically the NFR handguard, that actually did impress me. I wouldn't say it's anything special. However, considering that I purchased this item new for about 100 US dollars, it well exceeded my expectations. I did take the time to do a little head-to-head -head abuse testing to see how this handguard held zero compared to a couple of US options, and it did really well. It outperformed a Troy Battle Rail that cost $150, and it performed identically to a Knight's Rass, which cost north of $300. Keep in mind I'm working with a sample size of one, but based on that limited experience, I would have no problem using this product personally or recommending it to a friend. It seems like a solid product at a great price. Regarding the Samson IDF contract backup iron sight, it's great. This is a rock solid design and I like it enough that I'm gonna keep it to use on one of my own rifles. I am not at all a fan of the USGI Matex sight and if given the choice, I would choose the IDF Samson 10 times out of 10. As for the Meprolite M5 and MMX3 magnifier, this is where things get interesting. So interesting in fact that I've decided to save that for a separate video. I just don't think I have time to break that all down today. For the purpose of this video, I'll summarize that upcoming review by simply saying the tested Meprolite optics are very good, but not perfect. When directly compared to the duty grade aim points and EOTEX that we tend to favor in the US, I think the Meprolites offer serious competition. I'm still gonna give the raw performance edge to the American and Swedish products. However, I think there is a strong argument that Meprolite ultimately delivers more bang for your buck. The thing is, Meprolite products are available in the US market at a sizable discount compared to their most immediate competitors. And while I do think that some of those competitors are technically superior, I would say the difference in price is greater than the difference in performance. For that reason, I am hopeful that Meprolite figures out how to break more deeply into the US market. I think they have a place here. All that said, the Meprolites certainly aren't perfect. I didn't discover any critical flaws in either product I tested. However, I did identify three frustrating oversights in the designs. 
I use the word frustrating, particularly in reference to the M5, as I think that optic is only a couple of small and inexpensive design tweaks away from being exceptional rather than just very good. I'd love to see Mepperlite fix those things. So once again, if you're interested to know exactly what I'm talking about here and wanna see a review of either or both of those products, go ahead and check in the description of this video. That's where you'll find the link as soon as it's available. And if it's not there at the time you're watching, you could always consider subscribing. That way you'll get notified when it comes up. A little self-promotion. Um, either way, it should be one to two weeks tops. So with all that out of the way, I think the last thing I wanna do before wrapping up is to try and synthesize what I've learned by highlighting a few IDF M4 setups that make particular sense to me, especially in comparison to US alternatives. As a guy who spent his service primarily using heavy SOCOM profile 14 and a half inch barrels, I find the Israeli use of 12.6 inch pencil profile barrels extremely compelling. As such, I think setups like the one being used by this young woman make a whole lot of sense. This is a classic KISS carbine. It probably has a dry weight right at six pounds, and that's amazing for an M4. Obviously, a weapon light, laser, and magnifier can be nice to have, but as I mentioned in the last video, there is still a place for classic ultralight carbines. Sometimes simplicity has a value of its own, and it really depends on the user's occupational specialty. If a person's primary job is gunfighting day in and day out, yeah, we're probably gonna wanna make some changes here. But many other service members are most lethal when their weapons are slung and their hands are operating other equipment. For a person in a role like that, I think a carbine like this makes a ton of sense. Additionally, it should be noted that even if you have a job like this gentleman, which requires you to roll heavy on enablers, a short pencil barrel can really help offset that additional weight. If there's one thing the US Ordnance Corps has been consistently bad at, it is selecting barrel profiles that complement a weapon's role. And I think there's an argument that we in the US let go of pencil profile barrels prematurely. It personally makes me really happy to see that barrel profile live on in the IDF. Finally, I just wanna double down one final time on how intrigued I am by the Israeli concept of integrating active IR aiming into reflex sights, specifically regarding how that can eliminate the need for a heavy and poorly balanced front end to your weapon. And don't get me wrong here, bomb-proof free float handguards like the Sotmod Block 2's Riz 2 have their place. This is one of my favorite rifles. And if that's the type of setup you want or need, I don't think you can do much better than Daniel Defense. That said, those types of setups are in a totally different weight and handling class than this type of Israeli alternative, and I think alternatives are always a good thing. And at the end of the day, I think that's going to be my biggest takeaway from this exploration of American ARs in Israeli military service. In addition to using ARs exactly the way we use ARs, the IDF has created their own distinct niches. And those niches are best defined by clever combinations of parts and capabilities, which sometimes result in uniquely handy yet versatile carbines. And that's pretty cool. And with that, we're gonna wrap up for today, guys. As always, I hope this video was informative, entertaining, or at least worth the time you spent watching. If you did enjoy this video, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And if you did enjoy it, please let me know what you didn't like in the comments. I'm sure the comment section will remain civil and courteous, like all videos about the only democracy in the Middle East. Either way, thank you for taking the time to check out this video. Long live democracy, and have a great rest of your day.